Uh, my name is Ananya Bhairaj. I'm a student at JGU, currently enrolled in this course for German Women in Writing. I will be your student anchor for today. So welcome to the first guest lecture of the online lecture series on German Women in Writing. Our course, led by Dr. Shruti Jain, has always stressed on using literature to better understand the woman question and women's place in society throughout history. And this is why it brings us great joy to welcome today's speakers to speak on gender and queer studies perspectives on the same. And as some of us may already be aware, queer theory has emerged in the 1990s out of this uh, post-structuralist school of thought. And it allowed us for the first time to criticize structural oppression beyond the limits imposed by the standard binaries and beyond the language of the oppressor. So queer theory emphasizes on the fluidity and the multiplicity of human nature and contributions of queer thinkers such as Judith Butler, as we may have heard, have been instrumental for feminists of today to understand concepts such as gender performativity. So today we hope to use this lens to analyze people and women in literature as individuals with complex identities. So I would like to welcome first and foremost, uh, Professor Jagdish Batra, our Executive Dean in the Office of English and Foreign Languages at JGU. Professor Batra is a renowned academic, author, commentator, social activist, and he carries with him decades of experience in teaching and scholarship. We're extremely honored to have him here with us to inaugurate the lecture series. And I would now invite Professor Batra to give us his welcoming address. Thank you, Ananya. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Uh, I begin with welcoming Professor Meher Bhut, head of the Department of German, University of Mumbai. Also welcome uh, Christina Rath, dot lecturer at, uh, I think, Savitri Bhai Philippone University, am I right? Yeah. And of course, welcome Ananya Bhardwaj also. She is the student coordinator today. Uh, shortly, we'll be joined by Professor Sergio Mayra de Santa Cruz Alvera, who is the Center Coordinator for the Center for Foreign Languages under Office of English Foreign Studies at our university. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shruti Jain, Associate Professor and uh, sole faculty for German language as of now at the Center for Foreign Languages in our university. Friends, German language is uh, one of the favorite languages for Indian students. And uh, if uh, uh, you know, information on the net is right, then some 200,000 students are learning this language presently in different schools and colleges. And there are many reasons for its popularity. We know German is spoken not only in Germany, but also in Austria and Switzerland and parts of Africa. And it's the most widely spoken language, at least in Europe. And one of the reasons could be probably because Germany is uh, the leading economy in Europe at present. And uh, we have in India also so many German companies operating and manufacturing. And Dr. Shruti Jain did a wonderful presentation that day, told us all about uh, these companies. Relations between India and Germany go long back in time. In fact, a number of scholars took great interest in Indian classics during the colonial era. Max Muller, for example, studied Vedas and translated them into English because he had uh, settled permanently in England by that time. And German scholars were also responsible for developing what is called the Aryan invasion theory, which became a hit at that time. Even though, as it happens with history, you know, when newer findings come to the surface, the old ones are discarded. So this theory, which initially laid down that the Aryans came from Germany into India, was later revised to say that uh, they traveled from India to Germany. Right now, this theory is in gray zone, if I put it that way. Relations between Germany and India were not like any colonial power like between India and Britain, or Portugal and India. We know how Subhash Bose, a national hero, went to Germany to seek help to fight the British rulers at the time. Now, in India, so far as academics are concerned, uh, we study 
literature and philosophy courses. And there are a great many literary figures and philosophical figures belonging to Germany. For example, Goethe, Schiller, Kafka, Kant, Schopenhauer et al. And uh, no student of literature worldwide, I think, is unaware of the influence of German psychologists like Sigmund Freud and C.G. Jung. Uh, I'm pronouncing the way we normally pronounce uh, while teaching English literature. Maybe the pronunciation is different in German. Please excuse me for that. Germany's contribution to music also is awesome. Names like Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart need no introduction. And one of the Indian diasporic writers is Bowman Desai. He has written a novel, Trio One, and another part of it, Trio Two, that's based on the lives of uh, German music composers, Robert Schumann and Johannes Brahms. It's not to say that other writers have uh, not touched upon Germany, like uh, Victor Seit. Uh, one of his novels also deals with uh, his own family members who are settled in Germany, actually. Anyway, coming back to the event today, I think the topic chosen by the group on general study, gender studies is a very fascinating one. And I believe she'll be giving us the German perspective. Uh, friends, we are dealing with human material, you see, which is not homogeneous because it has myriad variations. And as uh, Martha Nassabom says, we have to be wary of what she calls descriptive romanticism and also normative chauvinism. We should not be romanticizing are exercising the description of the other. And at the same time, we should not insist upon applying our own yardsticks onto a different culture when we try to understand another culture because culture is uh, very dynamic and differentiated also. So therein lies the importance of getting the German point of view. We are thankful to you, Professor Boot, for sparing time to address us all. Also to Christina Roth, who will be soon completing a PhD for chairing this session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shruti, for having made it all possible with many more lectures in the term. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your words, Professor Bhatta. Uh, we're extremely glad to have you with us here today. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Kaja Lash, the director of G German Academic Exchange Service of New Delhi, was not able to join us today. So on her behalf, we have uh, Christina Roth, uh, the DAAD lecturer at SPPU Pune. And Christina Roth will be speaking on behalf of the DAAD as well as sharing the session. So she joined the Department of Foreign Languages of the Savitribai Pune Pune University as the DAAD lecturer in August 2021. And prior to this, uh, she pursued her PhD at the ARTES Graduate School for the Humanities at Cologne. And before her time in Pune and India, she has had a lot of experience teaching at the University of Cologne, as well as at the University of Adelaide in Australia. So she is an experienced academic in the field, and I'm sure we're all looking forward to her comments on the topic. I would like to invite Dr. Christina Rath to take, her, to take the floor for her address. Thank you so much for these kind words. Yeah. Uh, good evening to everyone, to all my colleagues, to all the students. And of course, to today's brilliant presenter, Professor Mihabut, and the wonderful coordinators of this event, Dr. Shruti Jain, and also to Dr. Professor Bata. Unfortunately, as you have just heard, my boss, Dr. Katya Lash uh, from DART, has other commitments today. But of course, I'm more than grateful to take her place and welcome you all to this guest lecture series on German women's writing. And I would like to start by thanking the Center of Foreign Languages at Jindal Global University, and in particular, Dr. Shruti Jain, for organizing this special event for the benefit of all of our students, our colleagues, and basically everyone who shares an interest in women's studies or women's writing, German studies, or at best, an interest in both German women's writing. Now, this lecture series will not only guide us through bits and pieces of Germany's literary history, 
but it will also educate us regarding the variety of topics related to women's writing in the German speaking context, starting today with an introduction to gender and queer studies, then going back in time in order to study ways of processing the violence experienced by women in Germany in 1945 in form of the diary report, A Woman in Berlin. Next, Post-Gender Echography in the World. I mean, how awesome is this title? Followed by discussions of novels such as Malina, Stefan's Heutungen, and last but of course never least, Jalinek's famous, The Piano Teacher. But what exactly are the prospects of the next weeks? Now, this lecture series focuses on women's writing across time and up to the present day. It will celebrate the diversity of women's writing throughout different genres, and it is actually distinctive in not being restricted to any particular time period, nor to being restricted to traditional models of periodization, thereby allowing for greater fluidity and points of transition, as in, for example, charging broader themes such as femininity or today gender across times. Now, doing this kind of a lecture series in the Indian context does, of course, also point to the global transnational aspirations of the series, challenging thereby preconceived ideas of cultural difference, exploring diverse understandings of women's writing, gendered identities, and of course, always the potential for literature to create bridges across international and also historical divides. Now, looking at the Forschungslandschaft, yeah, the research landscape, so to say, we can see that increasingly research in women's writing is embracing an interdisciplinary focus that allows dialogue between literary texts by women and the social and cultural context of their writing and receptions, often thereby revisiting and reframing our understandings of dominant historical and also contemporary accounts. Now, this interdisciplinarity is also something I'm very much looking forward to in this lecture series, as well as to a feminist intersectional approach that takes into account the diverse ways in which social positioning impacts identities, embodiment and experience, as these are explored in women's literature. So, on behalf of the DAAD, the Deutschen Akademischen Austauschdienst, I would like to welcome you all to this very exciting lecture series on German women's writing. And I'm very much looking forward to learning about and also discussing so many interesting topics related to women's writing with all of you in the upcoming weeks. And one last time, Shruti, of course, this event has only come to life due to your continuous efforts. So, vielen lieben Dank dafür. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Christina Rath. Uh, I would also like to call to the floor Dr. Shruti Jain herself, uh, our Associate Professor of German at JGU, who has led this initiative and course. We're also very grateful for her having coordinated this lecture series for us. And I now invite her to give her her introductory remarks. Oh, thank you so much, Ananya. And uh, good evening, everyone. I would like to thank you, Professor Batra, for taking our time to deliver the welcome address today. And you, Christina Rad, for speaking on behalf of Dr. Katya Lash, the director of the DAD New Delhi. Um, as many of you know, probably, I am a DAD alumna. And I have been associated with the DAD uh, since 2007, when I first visited the Humboldt University, uh, Berlin, with the scholarship funding that I received from the DAD. And in all these years, I have seldom come across a team as proactively engaged and com committed to the promotion of German studies in India as the current one. So thank you so much, Katya, for being here. And thank you so much to your team, which comprises of very, very competent lecturers, Dr. Jan Helge Weidemann, who has been um, to the JGU. Some of you have already met him. Dr. Christina Rath, uh, who you've just met uh, and heard, and Dr. Michael Stadler. Michael, um, welcome to our platform for the first time. Um, so these people are not just nice and collegial, as most DAD lecturers have always been, but they're also approachable, 
resourceful and very grounded and have a fair amount of understanding of ground realities of their Indian colleagues at various universities across India. So kudos to you. Um, it was during a DAD strategy workshop for German studies in India held in June 2022 uh, that, I, that the responsibility of conducting guest lecture series as a means of enhancing communication and strengthening networks among various German departments in India was delegated to me. Well, uh, I would have loved to do it anyway, so that was a thing that I, I gladly took up. The impetus for working on the theme of German women's writing, however, came from my own research interests. Uh, moreover, I have often been asked by students <clears throat> if uh, women in Germany do face problems such as female infanticide, domestic violence, rape, or discrimination at the workplace. Now, in my language courses, I usually try to find answers to such questions through newspaper articles or interviews or excerpts through novel, off of novels. Um, now, but then I thought, why not do a course that deals with novels? And it, it, it would perhaps not be a bad idea to offer an elective that presents the voices of women by women themselves, and hence materialize the course on German women's writing. Um, in the Anglo-American context, gender studies was already introduced as early as the 1970s. In the United States, there was a strong practical side of women's studies and the task of opening people's eyes to women's unrecognized real position in the community was an urgent one. In Germany, however, as Helga Kraft in her essay on Germ gender studies and Wissenschaftlichkeit in Germany writes, uh, that feminism was more academic and had to meet the standards of Wissenschaftlichkeit. That is a mode of argumentation relying heavily on theoretical and polemical approaches as an objective criterion for feminist findings. So gender studies in Germany took off in the 1990s, influenced by the writings of Judith Butler and Joan Scott and the emergence of post-colonial theory. The first MA program in gender studies was established rather late in 1997 at the Humboldt University Berlin. For a long, long time, not many women were hired in higher positions. You know, and even by the year 2000, only 7.2% of the total number of professorships was occupied by women in Germany, and from a total of 10,685 positions, only 765 were filled by women. I find that fascinating, you know, and very interesting. Um, 1990s and 2000, this was the condition in Germany. While preparing for the course, I realized that the discipline of women's studies is often coupled with or subsumed under gender studies and slash or queer studies in departments across the world. And I wondered why, because here we were trying to understand the societal conditions of women from the 19th century Germany onwards. We were trying to build a narrative of women in Germany and other German speaking countries. Gender, on the other hand, as Judith Butler argues, is fluid. It is a construct and hence undermines the position of women womanhood, a position from where early feminists started their struggle of establishing women's identity in an unforgiving and unjust patriarchal society. Does one end up, as many gender experts claim today, being exclusionist and essentialist when one focuses one research on women's studies, women only? And that leaves us with the question, uh, as Mayor, I just formulated, a little earlier, whether the woman question can be answered through the lens of gen gender studies. And in the course of uh, the online guest lecture series, we will have the privilege, as um, Christina Rad just said, of learning from experts who have spent a considerable amount of time of their careers, analyzing and understanding various issues that women writers such as Martha Hillers, Marlene Haushofer, Ingeborg Bachmann, Verena Stefan, and Frida Jelinek raised in their works. On that note, I end my introductory address and want to thank you, Dr. Meher Booth, for having agreed to deliver today's lecture on a vital theme of gender and queer studies. Over to you, Ananya. Thank you, Professor. Uh, and now I would request Ms. Christina Rath to take up her second role for today and introduce Professor Meher Booth, our esteemed, our esteemed guest, who will now deliver today's lecture. Yes, so again, it is my pleasure to introduce our first invited speaker in this lecture series, Professor Mia Wood, who is a professor and head at the Department of German Studies at the University of Mumbai. 
Her research centers around literature of the German minorities, post-colonial studies, and culture studies. And more than this, her interest lies with European cultural history and European history of art. Apart from her many academic scholarships and awards, she has recently co-edited books such as Inheriting Gandhi, Gandhi Dananao, and The COVID Spectrum. By the way, all of them from 2021 and 2022. I do not know how you did this, but yeah, amazing. And now today, Professor Good will speak about gender and queer studies, perspectives, and reflections. And I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for that introduction, Christina Ra. At the onset, let me thank Dr. Shruti Jain from the Center of Foreign Languages of the OP Jindal Global University, the German Academic Exchange Service, DAD, for having organized this lecture series on German women's writing, which is really needed. Talking about women and women's writing is something which we even need today. I would also like to thank Professor Jagdish Batra, the Dean of the Office of English and Foreign Languages of the Jindal University for having given us this platform where we can discuss, uh, where the Indian Germanists can discuss uh, German women's writing. It is both a pleasure and privilege to be the first in this series. And though the, through the lectures, there will be focus on German write, women writers and their works, Today, I choose to discuss key issues of the gender and queer theories and reflect on why it is imperative to deliberate them. And as uh, uh, Shruti just mentioned, whether the women's question is still pertinent in these theories. Uh, we'll begin with a small activity. I will share my screen and yeah. Yes. Okay. So we begin with a small activity. If you can read these two poems. And I had a Mentimeter activity, but I think I will just uh, <laughs> go with the chat. Uh, what I'd like to you to do is uh, read these two stanzas and whatever comes into your mind, just put in the words, phrases, whatever in the chat box and we'll take it up in the course of the lecture. So about a minute for your responses. Should we move ahead? I can see just the English guide, women, flock movement. So as you saw in both these stanzas and men may come and men may go and lives of great men all remind us the generic masculine, how it irritates us today. What happened then, way back in the 19th century, to women? Were there no trans? Were there no androgens? Let's reflect on that. In the history of humankind, the past and the present centuries have witnessed more upheavals due to the traditional patriarchal power structures, which have determined not only the societal and cultural aspects, but also the knowledge systems. In an age where identities are in a constant flux, it is not just the phenomen phenomena like forced and voluntary migration, political asylum, caste and class discrimination that have and continue to fragment identities, but through the centuries, the continued tradition of gender biases and gender oppression have also fractured identities. It may, however, be mentioned that the Greek antiquity did accept and acknowledge both homosexuality and lesbianism as part of the human trajectory, especially when we look in art about the pederastic relation between father god Zeus and Ganymede. In the 20th century, it forms the crux of Thomas Mann's novella, Death in Venice, uh, that's in 1912. Or look at Apollo, the mighty sun god, and his relationship with his gentle lover, Hyacinth. Or look at the Greek island, 
called Lesbos, from where we get the name Lesbian. A Greek, I, uh, 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 the Greek island Lesbos was also home to one of the greatest Greek poets, Sappho. The Indian text Kama Sutra itself includes a chapter about homosexual behavior, although other Indian texts would forbid it. And despite the ancient traditions, modern cultures through the ages have considered homosexuality illegal, penalized it. Be it the Irish poet Oscar Wilde, who was jailed for being a homosexual way back at the turn of the 19th century, or the British writer Virginia Woolf, who remained at crossroads due to her relationship with poet writer Vita Sackville West, history and patriarchal societies have not been very kind to women or to deviation from the binary norms of gender. And gender is what we have learned from a history and culture, as Judith Butler says, and to build models of gender through repetition. To quote Judith Butler from her seminal work, Gender Trouble, Feminism and Subversion of Identity, does Judith Butler for you in her work, Gender Trouble, she says, that the power regimes of heterosexism and phallologocentrism seek to augment themselves through a constant repetition of their logic. Their metaphysic and the naturalized ontologies does not imply that rep repetition itself ought to be stopped, as if it could be. If repetition is bound to persist as the mechanism of the cultural reproduction of identities, then the crucial question emerges, what kind of subversive repetition might call into the question the regularity practice of identity itself? Looking at the power structures that determine or disrupt the making of an individual's identity, I would thus like to reflect on the theoretical de deliberations of gender studies and queer studies with the aim of critiquing the binary perception of gender and the stereotypes that have been endorsed in order to come to a more progressive and equal society where equal individuals with diverse genders are respected and accepted for who they are. Of course, that would also include the question of women. This lecture is thus an attempt to understand how and why binary perceptions need to be revised in order to have not only more inclusive societies and cultures, but also to mitigate the soft violence which is meted out on those who do not adhere to the gambit of traditionally gendered identities. I hence uh, divide the lecture as follows with a brief history of feminism, which is important to reflect on contributions of both feminism and this construction as theories for gender and queer studies, the theoretical aspects from the second part with uh, uh, emphasis on sex and gender. And the third part assesses the role of these theories, their role for reading literature, especially for interpreting women's writings and looking at the women's perspectives in literature. The facet will reflect on the relevance of these theories for our times and also in the Indian context, what it means for us today. Where most of the other literary theories have evolved out of the philosophical conceptions and contemplations, theories like feminism, gender studies, queer studies are some of the few theories which have directly evolved from the praxis. The roots of these theories are found in sociopolitical movements coupled with fierce activism happening in Western parts of the world especially Europe and the US and gaining momentum in other continents. Feminism being one such movement which led to feminist theories is thus of significance for both gender and queer studies. Thus a brief history of feminism would reveal why it was right for gender studies to emerge as a discipline. Now protests by women for their rights have been suppressed since time immemorial. And evidence of one such suppressing goes back to the third century BCE. When Roman women 
fought to repeal laws which prohibited them from using expensive goods, the ruling consul at that time, Mar uh, Marcus Cato, retorted, I quote, if they are victorious now, what will they attempt? As soon as they become, as soon as they begin to be your equals, they will have become your superiors. Close quotes. This gendered attitude and bias, which continued through history, has proved majorly detrimental for women throughout history. Although through the ages such protests by women are far and few, there have been contributions by noted female intellectuals. With the age of enlightenment, we have the French playwright Olympe de Gouges, who publishes the Declaration of the Rights of Women and of the Female Citizen. So she spells out female citizen in 1791, declaring women to be not only man's equal, but his partner. In the following year, the champion of the women's rights, Mary Wollstonecraft publishes, that's Mary Wollstonecraft, publishes a vindication of the rights of women. And that's in 1792. So here you see the title page of this American edition of uh, her vindication of the rights of women with strictures on political and moral subjects. Now she proposes equal opportunities in education, work, and politics for women way back in 1792. She mentions that women are as naturally rational as men. If they are silly, I quote, it is only because society trains them to be irrelevant. Quote close. Such perceptions about women got further endorsed by the, by the patriarchal society and by theories of biologists like Geddes and Thompson in 1889, who postulated that social, psychological, and behavioral traits are caused by metabolic states. Now, according to Geddes and Thompson's, what he does, he says, women conserve energy and are hence anabolic. Now, what does it mean to be anabolic? Traits of being passive, sluggish, conservative, uninterested in politics are the attributes of an anabolic personality. Men, on the other hand, expend energy. That is, they are catabolic. And what does it mean to be catabolic? They are eager, they are energetic, they are passionate, they are variable, and they're interested in politics. Now, this is the justification which is going to be used through the history why women are not allowed to vote and why women are not allowed to enter politics. But interestingly enough, at the same time, that is in the latter half of the 19th century, when you have on one hand biologists making such statements, you have feminine, feminist activism taking shape in the United States. So by the mid 19th century, issues surrounding feminism are being voiced and social changes are already happening and women win the right to vote in national elections. Now this happens way back in 1893, in New Zealand, which is largely not urban in those days. Uh, New Zealand, Australia were both like the black holes for the Eurocentric image. In Australia in 1902, women win the right to vote. In Finland, it takes 1906 and Norway 1913. So if you look at what's happening, it is the Scandinavian, it is Australia and New Zealand, but the European continent is amongst the latter ones where women will get their right to vote. It is only in 1903 that the British Women's Social and Political Union, which is a women-only movement founded by Emmeline Pankhurst, that the first social movement of the 20th century uh, gets initiated. 
and culminates in the first wave of feminism. So you have feminism, which comes about in waves. And when we look at the efforts of Wollstonecraft and Pankhurst, you have between 1848 and 1920, where the first wave of feminism is beginning. Also known as the suffragette movement, it becomes militant under Pankhurst. And then at the turn of the century, in the first two decades of the century, you have active participation by women, especially by women writers. Among them uh, is our Virginia Woolf and her essay, A Room of One's Own in 1929 after the First World War with the argument that a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction, which becomes something what we can call a feminist manifesto. So this marks the first wave of feminism and deals mainly with uh, uh, what Wollstonecraft had begun with a fight for women's education and women's rights. The second wave, so we have a picture here of the uh, movement in New York City. Women have no vote at all. And that's when the women go to streets marching we, way back in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the second wave of feminism. Now, if, you, if I can take you back and you see those are the war years, 1920, and then the uh, post Second World War, the economies are building up. It takes almost another 40 years when feminism becomes active. Of course, it is mainly because of the historical reasons. And uh, we also need to reflect on, I would not be doing it now, but I can leave you all to reflect on the position of women in Nazi Germany, how women were used and manipulated, how women became uh, uh, kind of products of uh, national soci sociali socialism uh, products and machines to produce the so-called Aryan race. Uh, women were sent to this place in Norway called Lebensborn to actually produce or to, uh, 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 I mean, create to, uh, to have sex with these Norwegian men, the Aryan race, to preserve the Aryan race, and to create progeny for Hitler's Germany. So the position of women in uh, national socialism becomes a separate chapter by itself, and I would not be dealing with it. But when we look here, the second wave begins again in 1960s, and that's again somewhere in the United States. So the second wave, which roughly uh, is between 1963 to the 1980s, uh, talks more about equal rights, specialness of women, and a sense of sisterhood. Uh, there are works like Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystic, uh, or Mary Elman's Thinking About Women, or Kate Millett's Sexual Politics in 1970, which become path-breaking for women's studies. Now, this wave also addresses issues like domestic violence, marital rape, and creates women's shelters and rape crisis centers. Now, around this time, that is between 1960s to 1980s, uh, this kind of activism, which is happening in US, also catches on in the rest of the world. And even in India, you have the beginnings of uh, uh, NGOs where they are, uh, women are trying to help other women and the formation of NGOs uh, does begin here. So, in fact, even talks of uh, uh, talking about women's studies has its shape in the second wave of feminism. Now, uh, Due to this strong activism, changes also happen in the legal field. That is, custody laws and divorce laws change. So it is like in the latter half of the 20th century that women are able to uh, have 
joint custody in case of divorce. Uh, yeah. So furthering this, activism in USA is also established where you have something called feminist-owned bookstores and feminist-owned restaurants. These spaces become the locations for deliberation, agitation, and activism. But as we see that, uh, and uh, let me also tell you this, that in the second wave of feminism, uh, the term second wave gets coined by the journalist Martha Lear, who in 1968 in New York Times writes an article. The second feminist wave, what do these women want? So this is the title of an article, which after which then the uh, uh, movement is called the second wave. And uh, Martha Lear writes, I quote Martha Lear, proponents call it the second feminist wave. The first having ebbed after the glorious victory of suffrage and disappeared finally into the great sandbar of togetherness, close unquote. But this wave is then reduced by another. And as you can see in the slide already, we have the third wave of feminism, which is happening in the 1990s. So a reaction against the second wave. Now this third wave is against the second wave, mainly for two reasons. And uh, possibly this is going to answer your question too, Shruti. What about this question about the women? Does gender theory relegate then the question of women. So the third wave begins with the critique that all women do not share the same identity, that a variety of women of all races and countries exist. And this is the turning point where gender studies will uh, evolve. The famous writer, American writer, Bell Hooks, she writes, ain't I a woman, black women and feminism in 1981. And this is a path breaking book in discussing the oppression of black women in America during the slavery years and correlating it with the effects in the present. So what the second wave is fighting for, for the women's rights, which women are we talking about? And that's the a question uh, which the third wave seeks to answer by saying that not all women are having the same problems, not all women are in the same boat. And this leads, Bell Hook's work, Ain't I a Woman, leads to intersectionality or the acknowledgement that experiences of oppression and discrimination become unique to individuals and they can get marginalized due to gender, caste, sex, race, ethnicity, class, sexuality, religion, in our times disability, and therefore we have now critical disability studies by something like weight and physical appearance. So this is now the point of intersex intersectionality, which is going to be very, very prevalent in women's studies and uh, in raising all issues related to women's studies. So now we cannot think about women's studies, A, without interdisciplinarity and B, without intersectionality. Uh, the term intersectionality itself is rooted in the works of Kimberly Crenshaw, she has coined the term to address the ways in which different forms of oppressions intersect. So for example, it's not just being about oppression for women, but an oppression of a black woman is different from an oppression of a white woman or the oppression in the Indian context of a Brahmin woman is different from a Dalit woman being oppressed. So uh, the points of intersectionality are something which we now cannot disregard. 
Hence, for contemporary feminists, both interdisciplinarity and intersectionality play a huge role in defining the identity, reflecting that all women are not equal. So the third wave thus engages with anti-essentialist anti impulses of de deconstruction as it fights for equality and equity for women, and it fights against uh, sexual harassment at workplace. So now the questions of sexual harassments are coming up with the third wave. Much of the third wave, as was rightly mentioned in the inaugural lectures, uh, is influenced by the works of Judith Butler, whom we've already seen. And she argues that both gender and sex are constructed and gender is performative. So the combined influence of Kimberley Crenshaw and Judith Butler's theories have led to what we now acknowledge as gender studies, which is then further going to develop into queer studies. And then we also have now today, we are speaking not only of three waves of feminism, but uh, we are speaking in the 21st century of the fourth wave. Uh, loosely, we can see the beginnings around 2008 when you have the intervention of digital media, especially Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, blogging, and which are very, very firmly entrenched in our cultural fabric today. We cannot think about society without, these, uh, without the influence and intervention of the digital media. So currently, uh, uh, by 2013, uh, the idea has already been widespread that we have entered into the fourth wave of feminism. And the fourth waivers are actually the driving force behind uh, all these hashtag movements, which we have been uh, witnessing since 2018. Uh, you have the hashtag Me Too and Time's Up, the hashtag Yes All Women, and so forth. And then there are also these transnational movements like you had in 2011, you had the slut walk movement, which happened in uh, uh, Canada. And uh, the slut walk movement was basically a protest of the idea that the way to prevent rape is for women to stop dressing like sluts. So all these have formed the uh, part of the fourth wave campaigns. Now, in all its phases, feminism has been about taking women seriously and respectfully. It has sought to emphasize that it is not what we want, uh, that it is not equality alone that we want, but it is also about equity. So it is not about women being equal to men, but having the basic equity that is even having the equal share uh, when it comes to pay paychecks. Now, the second wave, which is happening in the 80s, uh, it's the 80s, I think, or uh, 1980s, which I mean, of course, uh, very relevant in the culture studies uh, area because you have a vast number of paradigm shifts which are continuously happening. It's not only post-colonialism which is happening, but the post-structuralists have kind of invaded the territory of cultural culture studies and out of which then you have uh, the turns which are being born, the, uh, the uh, linguistic turn and the performative turn and the uh, medial turn and the spatial turn, which, is, which are all stemming out from these theories and movements which are happening between the 60s and the 80s. So dynamically, a very, very vibrant period. Now, the second wave of feminism, coupled with Derrida's theory of deconstruction, which begins in the 1970s, gives to this new rise of thinking, which shifts the focus from women and looks at the culture and society, social constructs of gender and relationships. So it's Derrida's break from the binary thinking that we cannot see the world. The post second world cannot be seen with the Euro, uh, uh, Eurocentric lens of black and white, 
east and west, man and woman, and so on and so forth. These binaries get broken due to deconstruction. So coming now to the second part of my lecture, that is to gender and queer studies, what does this new thought process do, uh, do for us? As it emerges in 1990s, it starts to analyze the dynamics of power play. It questions the structured cultural and social norms of patriarchy and opens the doors for all genders. So it is now not the question of women alone, but it becomes more inclusive and it talks about genders. Now, this is, I feel very important because it is not, I would say, digressing from the area of women's studies or digressing from the question of women. It is trying to be inclusive and in being inclusive, it is also giving the woman the right to be what she wants. So the woman also gets her right to perform the gender which she chooses to be. And therefore, I would now shift my focus from feminism to gender studies and to queer studies. So the focus with gender studies is now not only on femininity, but also on masculinity. And both, however, are now regarded as historically changeable categories and cultural constructs. So gender studies attempts to perceive women as social and cultural constructs whose identity is no longer defined in context to men. So this is for the women absolutely a break away from the patriarchal lens or from the male gaze. And that is why I find gender studies more important uh, in addressing the women's question than feminism alone, which is addressing the women's question. And as the construct does not remain static, it becomes historically and culturally variable. Thus, the role and the function of genders change. Both the theories, that is Derrida's deconstruction and Foucault's discourse analysis will help to enhance this concept. Theoretically, the third wave is also influenced by the works of Simone de Beauvoir and Kate Millett, but the point of takeoff for gender studies stems primarily from the distinction between sex and gender. And this uh, uh, sex and gender uh, uh, is mentioned in Simone de Beauvoir's uh, work way back in 1949 in her Second Sex, uh, the, that's the title of her book. Uh, it is only in 1975, during the second wave, that Gail Rubin, that's Gail Rubin for you, in her essay, The Traffic in Women, Notes on the Political Economy of Sex, discusses the sex and gender question at length. So what begins in the 1950s with Simone de Beauvoir's questioning sex and gender, Gail Rubin kind of solves the sex and gender conundrum by defining a sex gender system. Uh, I quote, she says, as the set of arrangements by which a society transforms biological sexuality into products of human activity and in which these transformed sexual needs are satisfied. So Gail Rubin argues that writers earlier had failed to adequately explain women's oppression and offers a reinterpretation of their ideas. And why this question of women's oppression is not being answered correctly is because this distinction between gender and sex has not taken place. And therefore, the third wave uh, is, which is going to be doing exactly that, that is address the and explain women's oppression. Uh, Gail Rubin addresses, uh, uh, her takeoff point is the Marxist theory, and she addresses Marxist thought by identifying women's role within a capitalist society 
and argues that the reproduction of labor power depends upon the woman's housework to transform commodities into sustenance for the worker. Now, this system of capitalism cannot generate surplus without women. And yet, this is a system which uh, does not grant women access to the resulting capital. And therefore, the distinctions, the differences between the male and female have risen. And that is why uh, the third wave is not fighting just for equality, but also for equity. Uh, Gail Rubens further states that the historical patterns of female uh, oppression are responsible for the role of women in capitalist societies. So she sees gender as a socially imposed division of sexes. And this socially imposed division gets enhanced by the system of kinship. I'll just deviate a little and talk about the system of kinship, uh, which is endorsed by the Marxist theory. She states that the kinship systems reproduce concrete forms of socially organized sexuality. So what is this system of kinship? It is something like the barter system where we are talking about exchange. So women who are born biologically female become gendered when the distinction between the male giver and the female gift is made within an exchange. So women are seen as products to be bartered in order to maintain what they call peace. A very primitive form of exchange to maintain peace was to get women married off to, uh, with members of rivaling, uh, riv uh, um, um, of rivals of, of uh, rivalry clans. We have seen in the history that marriages, even in the uh, European uh, nobility, were mainly for territorial purposes, mainly to maintain peace, and mainly for political reasons. The very fact that Bombay, an island, Mumbai as it is now called, was something which Catherine the Braganza got as a dowry, gave it to her command, shows that women have been used as products for this bartering. A woman cannot give another woman, that is a mother is not allowed to give her the daughter's hand to another man. This is uh, something which is a prerogative of men. And uh, the very fact that when we talk about incest being a taboo, where men could not have incestual relations with their daughters or men with their sisters, the way women are subjugated, uh, they become the female gifts for these male giver men. So this is one way of subjugating women further. And this is this uh, kinship system which has operated by and large in most societies throughout the world. Uh, Gail Rubens gives example in her essay, uh, not only alluding to uh, European traditions, but also to regions in Africa. So for men giving the gift of a daughter or a sister to another man for the purpose of matrimony allows for the formation of kinship ties between two men and the transfer of sexual access, genealogical statuses, lineage names and ancestors, rights and people. Now, such formations of alliance have also allowed polygamous societies uh, since time immemorial. In fact, even your, our epics are uh, privy to these kinds of polygamous uh, alliances. Rubin's play Doyer is therefore for rewriting of this Marxist, Marx and Friedrich Engel. Uh, Friedrich Engels writes, origin of the family, uh, private property and state in 1884, where the uh, 
uh, where he lays down, postulates what can be uh, in a family, what can be given to a woman, what cannot be, what rights women have, and so on and so forth. So her play doy of her rewriting this origin of the family, uh, unfortunately, still remains unheard. Uh, our legal system has not uh, uh, emancipated itself yet. There have been changes, but we still have a long way to go. Now, Rubens ultimately hopes uh, for a more androgynous and genderless society. Therefore, the third wave with gender studies becomes more meaningful. Uh, so she hopes for an androgynous and genderless society in which sexual difference has no socially constructed and hierarchical meaning. So let's look at the differences what uh, Gail Rubens alludes to. So the distinction stems from that sex is something which one is born with. So it is defined by the biology and anatomy and gender is what one becomes and therefore gender is constructed. Gender has to do not with the biological body, but more with the emotional. Sex is about being male or female, whereas gender is being more feminine or masculine. Now, looking at these differences, uh, this distinction gets critiqued by Judith Butler in her work, Gender Trouble, 1991. Uh, seminal work for gender studies. Uh, Butler, who is also influenced by both Foucault and Derrida, sees the body as produced discursively and culturally constructed. According to her, it is a society that subscribes particular traits to the body as masculine and feminine. And through this, the roles and the expectations arise making gender not biologically coded, but culturally. So the body is the place for, so, is thus a social phenomenon. And this helps her to overcome the binary distinction between the male and female, which is uh, something which the deconstructionist Derrida is also looking at. So hence, if being a woman is a constructed gender, the body is bound by symbolic constructions and social norms. So a new image of the woman is created. And this new image of a woman is limited neither by patriarchy, and since we are talking mainly about uh, European and Western uh, American theories, this image of the woman is limited neither by patriarchy nor by the Christian norms. So you have this new image of woman being created thanks to gender studies. So gender studies is not just bypassing the question of woman, but it is also helping uh, us to have this new image of a woman being constructed without the context of it being looked at from the masculine point of view. Now, Butler thus sees gender as that which is performed and that which is performative. So gender is defined as a social role enacted or performed by individuals, and this gets validated by the society. Now, the way Derrida postulates that in the free play of signs, the signifier leads to a significant uh, to the signified, and that signified becomes uh, itself a signifier for another signified, and so on and so forth. So does gender, in its performance, uh, proliferate into many forms. That is, the continuous performance acquires new meanings with each new performance, depending on the context. So gender is now what is provisional, it is shifting, it is contingent, and it is performed. Uh, I would here like to quote uh, the very famous French surrealist photographer and uh, writer, 
whose uh, poster you see in the background in today's poster shruti has put this uh, uh, self portrait of claude cahun uh, and she says i quote masculine feminine it depends on the situation neuter is the only gender that always suits me so as no two performances can be the same these variations are bound to happen and uh, these variations are something which are now welcome so identity as a performance can suggest that people may choose whatever performance they want and it is this performance of identity which constructs the self so now this uh, uh statement that people may choose whatever performance they want includes also the women so women are no longer bound by the masculine perception of what a woman ought to be but a woman has every right to perform whatever she wants to be at any given point of time and therefore she constructs now her own identity and her own self so the performance of identity is what in our today's times is going to construct the self uh we can have a look here at these two very famous men who choose now you can call it in their case a publicity statement or because they are at events very very public figures and they are doing it in the public sphere to make a statement to make their point of view to address their own gender fluidity whatever the reason may be but it's an acceptable norm and no one is challenging this so uh it brings me to another talking about performing performance of identity it's uh, we have seen in hollywood and bollywood films also uh even in the 70s and 80s uh, men were disguised as women and women would disguise as men but these were more in a teasing way you see with this movie orlando in 1992 the british actress tilda swinton actually playing the role of the young orlando throughout the movie so a british female actress plays the role of this male throughout the movie the question is why a male is not portraying the role of orlando but why tilda swinton as an actor is uh orlando by the way is also based on the novel by virginia wolf it which was filmed and i think in 2018 there's a, a movie called vita and i which is uh, a biography of virginia wolf's relationship with uh, vita sackwell uh, vita west uh, sackwell which has also been filmed uh you also have a you know, Kamal Hassan who so beautifully the macho Kamal Hassan plays the role of Chachi Charso Beast in the 1997 movie and carries himself so aesthetically feminine in a feminine way now does that make a heterosexual man effeminate is the man just heterosexual no this is exactly what queer studies is going to talk about but now before we go on to queer studies i would like to share with you a video of um uh judith butler what she uh so uh, what she means when she talks about performative gender so you need to tell me whether it's one thing to say that gender is performed and that's a little different from saying gender is performative when we say gender is performed we usually mean that we've taken on a role we're acting in some way um and that our acting or our role playing is crucial to the 
gender that we are and the gender that we present to the world. To say that gender is performative is a little different because for something to be performative means that it produces a series of effects. We act and walk and speak and talk in ways that mm, consolidate an impression of being a man or being a woman. You know, I was walking down the street in Berkeley when I first arrived several years ago, and a young woman who was, I think, in high school leaned out of her window and she yelled, are you a lesbian? And, <laughs> and she was looking to harass me. Or maybe she was just freaked out or she thought I looked like I probably was one and wanted to know. But instead I just turned around and I said, yes, I am. And that really shocked her. We act as if that being of a man or that being of a woman is actually an internal reality or something that's simply true about us, a fact about us. Actually, it's a phenomenon that's being produced all the time and reproduced all the time. So to say gender is performative is to say that nobody really is a gender from the start. I know it's controversial, but that's my claim. Think about how difficult it is for sissy boys or how difficult it is for tomboys <laughs> to function socially without being bullied or without being teased or without sometimes suffering threats of violence um, or without their parents intervening to say maybe you need a psychiatrist or why can't you be normal. So, you know, there are institutional powers like psychiatric normalization and there are mm, informal kinds of practices like bullying which try to keep us in our gendered place. There's a real question for me about how such gender norms get established and policed and what the best way is to disrupt them and to overcome the police function. It's my view that uh, gender is, a, is, is culturally formed but it's also a domain of agency or freedom. It's most important to resist the violence that is imposed by ideal gender norms, especially against those who are gender different, who are non-conforming non in, their, in their gender presentation. Coming to this post-modern no, uh, notion of gender, which uh, uh, Judith Butler also outlines, uh, it is in line with the de deconstructive ethos to break the binaries. Now, this results also in paving the way for queer studies where the multiplicity of gender becomes liberating. So as she pointed out, the, uh, what gender uh, studies does is, uh, uh, performing genders does is actually, it is an agency of freedom. Now, this agency of freedom is used by women to express their sexuality too. So uh, queer studies, I come to this point of queer studies, now suggest many ways to enact gender and sexual desire. Although cultures have repressed queer acts or abused it in the past, active social movements in the present have helped in gaining more rights for the queers especially in India, the latest being the repealing of the Section uh, 377, an act which was introduced by the British colonial rule and which made sexual acts against nature illegal. Uh, apart from that, there are significant contributions uh, made by organizations. You have this very famous gay pride marches and the gay parades, uh, the pride marches, which uh, uh, very appropriately uh, the acronym PRIDE, meaning professionalism, respect, integrity, diversity, and excellence, celebrates every year in June, the Pride Month. Uh, and here you see this uh, inn called the Stonewall Inn. That is the place where the queer activism actually began. So every year in June in USA, the uh, gay pride uh, commemorates the Stonewall Riots of 20th June 1969, where a series of violent confrontations between the police and the gay rights activists had taken place in the small Greenwich village 
outside the New York City. And this was actually where the uh, international gay right movements started. Even today in most metropolises all over the world, there's a Pride Month. It's not necessarily celebrated only in June. It's celebrated in different months in different parts of the world. Uh, in Cologne, Germany, uh, uh, the gay pride parade is around June, July. And since 19, um, since, sorry, 2021, you have this homochrome, uh, which, which is the largest German speaking uh, uh, festival for queer literature. So in 1921, you had it for the first time, 19, this is 1922. It's not only a literary festival, it's a film festival. Uh, it's uh, organized uh, for art, culture, films, readings, sports, an absolutely cultural festival. Uh, Homochrome website, I have mentioned here the link, so one can go and check out the work they do. Um, they have even uh, writings by queer authors, and uh, they have published two volumes of short stories uh, written or by queer authors on queer characters. In fact, I should mention that one of my uh, MA uh, students has written her MA dissertation, submitted it last week on uh, hegemonial structures in society uh, using uh, short stories from the homochrome uh, compilation of uh, texts. So queer studies has now emerged out of the lesbian and gay studies with a difference. Uh, both lesbian and gay as terms can be limiting, as terms for sexual orientation can be as limiting as being straight. So drawing on the deconstruction thinking and going beyond the binary opposition, the term queer is therefore suggestive of an instability and is seen as a continuous process making gender fluid. So that is what we are talking about now, gender fluidity. So in a way, queer studies has also deconstructed gay and lesbian studies. It has given a wider scope to the variety of sexualities and orientations. Uh, Originally, it meant the word queer in English language as we have been using it. It originally meant strange, odd, peculiar, or even eccentric. Today, it is an umbrella term encompassing all gender types, including the cis gender. Now, what is a cis gender? So, a cis gender is somebody uh, who is uh, who has gender identity that matches the sex during the birth. For example, a person who is assigned uh, uh, the sex of being a female at birth and identifies herself as a woman or a girl is a cis gender or a cis male or a female. So queer studies is now including them too. It is not just about the LGBTQA. So with this, now what we need to do is we need to reconceptualize the definition of heterosexuality. So naturally the question, the image of woman changes with this redefining and reconceptualizing the uh, term heterosexuality because heterosexuals too can find pleasure in staring at celebrities or famous personalities of their own sex. How many of us who claim to be heterosexuals are also enamored and charmed by celebrities belonging to our sex, if I may call. So heterosexual females may, and then again, heterosexual females may prefer feminine men and not muscular men, or masculine or heterosexual males may prefer athletic muscular women and not the very fragile feminine women. So these shifts are happening even within the heterosexuality. So what is heterosexual? That is also now to be defined. We need to look at it from that lens. So queer studies becomes more inclusive. It challenges all these essentialized notions and it does not out anyone. So this term outing, uh, uh, we now have these new terms like cancel cultures and 
outing people, that does not happen with queer studies. Two key concepts which I would like to mention uh, important for this theory, that is queer studies, are the break from naturalization of heterosexuality and compulsory heterosexuality. The assumption that everyone is born heterosexual and if not, needs to practice heterosexuality has led to much suffering and to fragmentation of identities. Both the terms have been popularized by the poet essayist Adrian Rich in her 1980 essay, Compulsory Heterosexuality and Lesbian Existence. And as a theory, queer studies thus emerges in this, um, uh, 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 taking this as a cue and focuses on matters related to gender, human sexuality, and sexual orientation with an emphasis on the LGBTQA issues and culture. Now the queer theorists begin with the empirical observation and de that definitions of proper and improper sexual and gender identity have varied significantly over time and space and that such definitions have paid, played major roles in uh, power structures. So queer, in order to reconstruct it, deconstruct these power structures is a continuous crossing of boundaries, transgressing from the norm and not subscribing to traditional categories, letting individuals now come out of the closet. Coming out of the closet, a term used by Eva Kosovsky Sedgwick in her book, Epistemology of Closet. Sedgwick also echoes Butler in, the, in her uh, uh, notion of gender as a performative, she defines queer as failing to exist, uh, failing to fit existing categories. Uh, she also talks that it is not only about the LGBTQA, but it is also those that is queer are also those who are unsure of their sexual or gender identities, those who are reclaiming old or inventing new sexual and gender identities, those who identify as heterosexuals but wish to announce their strong support for the LGBTQIA and those who believe in sexual liberation. All of them can be defined as queer as per uh, Sedgwick. Now, uh, I would uh, go on to the next bit about what literature does for gender and queer theories, how these theories can help us read texts, both gender and queer theories seek to subvert power structures. Hence, for the analysis of literary texts, the societal, political, economic, religious fields are critic. Because the order of gender is finally the order of the society, the relationship between men and women as determined in the social realm are analyzed and examined. Gender studies has divided itself into reconstructive and deconstructive feminism. So as part of reconstructive feminism, it uh, uh, aims to fill the gaps in history and the gaps of how women were bypassed, how female writers were forgotten, how their biographies were forgotten, how their perspectives were not taken into consideration. So one is now looking at those perspectives. In contrast to the reconstructive feminism, the deconstructive feminism is juxtaposing authors and texts and questioning the socio-cultural genders. Uh, now these paradigms are determined by three main processes. Um, I'll just skip that. Uh, one is the ecritor feminine, that is a term uh, used by Helena Sissou, uh, where she talks about uh, uh, the basic concept that the feminine artic is the articulation of female sexuality in writing and how it has uh, been evaded. That means what we have been reading so far has been through the male, through the uh, what she calls as the phallic thinking. It is uh, imperative now to break from this phallic perception of what uh, women need to be in art and literature, and with the introduction of literature feminine, Sisu 
finds an expression to break from a fallow log uh, phallocentric language which has dominated our uh, history. Uh, so now if we look back at the poem, The Brook, where we saw uh, that passing of time is captured in 19th century by the phrase, for men may come and men may go, you now have something like Maya Angelou talking about passing time in this language. So uh, I will leave you with this. Another important uh, trend is about representing gender. So how are we looking now at women? in literary texts. Are they also reduced to stereotypes the way they were with uh, women being uh, assigned the roles of mermaids, Lorelei's, Medea, Cassandra? Gender studies now seeks to change this way women and non-binary genders get represented. Uh, let's look at this poem about uh, by Yoko Tawada, uh, a German writer the second person I, and you will see a shift from this very, very male dominated phallocentric language. And then we are talking about gender and performativity. The American writer Shira Tarrant is, underlines the relevance of performing and performative genders and its significance for arts and literature. She talks about, I quote, she says, gender is something we are born with isn't some sorry isn't something we are born with it's something we perform we learn about doing gender through friends school religion and family we are taught to do gender in many ways our parents might tell us to toughen up when we go out for sports if we are boys our parents might not worry if we stay out late but if we are girls we might get into trouble for getting angry so what is gender studies and queer studies what are they striving for researching and reevaluating texts of female writers, analyzing the stereotypical representations of males and female, in particular, analyzing the feminine themes in canonical texts written by male writers, rewriting the history of literature from the other perspective, continuously critiquing the existing male, pra uh, uh, male praxis in literature, the media arts, has now shifted its focus or managed to turn the male gaze into the female gaze. New forms of narratology are evolving. You have a gender-oriented narratology by Ansgar and Vera Neuning in the German literature, which also explores the possibilities uh, which arise when the narrator's gender is not identifiable. So both gender and queer studies are now helping us to understand the dominating patriarchal structures which have existed and the power politics in a particular culture and how we can now reconceptualize them. Queer studies also involves itself where literature is concerned in questioning the cultural assumptions about queer in literature. Uh, what are the questions we are asking? Do the characters in literary work uh, uh, take the quotidian for granted? Are the queer characters taken for granted? Who is desiring whom? How are the characters responding to the cultural resistance? Is there a resistance? Are they resisting what we call our normal? Do they oppose it or do they accept it? Do they come out of the closet or do they suppress their feelings? How do texts understand masculinity and femininity? So more important, it is, are these texts, is art now teasing the themes which it earlier did with, uh, and it also does in stand-up comedies. Are we teasing these themes? Are we laughing about them? Or are we taking these themes seriously? I come to the last bit, the facet, just three more minutes. So reflecting on both the theories, we need to way, find a way forward. Can we come to terms with the fact that it's not just about males and females. It's not just the woman question alone, but it is about opting 
for what you want to be called. So there are over 72 genders which can exist. We have also what today we call the non-gendered or gender neutral pronouns, which we can choose and this a woman can also do. Can we look at the small island of Sulawesi in Indonesia, which officially recognizes five genders? Uh, I'm not going to go into these genders. Can we have more inclusive cultures or are these cultures utopian? Can we have, with the question of gender and queer studies, less violence in society, not only for them, but also for women? Despite repealing of 377 in 2018 and decriminalizing homosexuality in over 133 countries, only 32 countries allowed same-sex marriage and consider it legal. We've just had on 13th March another verdict. Despite social reforms, activism, homophobic cultures prevail. Not only politically correct language, but also gender correct language is something which we need to implement. So when we are talking about just the question of women, are we also including the others? Like in 2008, the European Parliament is the first international organization to bring out a 13 page booklet on gender neutral language. This gender sensitization needs to be taught and implemented. Simple steps, look at these simple texts adopted by two airlines, the Japan Airlines and the Lufthansa, which is now we are talking 2020 and 2021, where Japan Airlines drops ladies and gentlemen and says attention all passengers or uh, uh, Lufthansa says no longer ladies and gentlemen, it's dear guest. Now, where are these changes going to take place? How is the way forward uh, going to look like? Where are the locations where we can transform our thought processes and transform societies? If arts can provide a way out, so can educational institutions. We need to create more awareness in the pedagogy. There have been organizations, NGOs in India, in Delhi, the Nirantar, if most of you have heard of, who have tirelessly worked to overhaul school books, to look at them from the other perspective. And then again, there are headlines like this, which this is a headline which appeared in yesterday's Bombay Times, where the hospitality industry has welcomed the LGBTQIA includes, it's been more inclusive. It is these headlines which signal towards a new dawn. It is these headlines which take, which are not talking only about inclusive cultures for the trans community and for the queer, but it is taking the women along. And yet I would say we have a long way to go. I end with this beautiful poem by Maya Angelou. And I thank you for your patient listening and for overshooting by almost 10 minutes. So thank you. I will stop sharing the screen. Yes. Should I take over? Yes. Yes, perfect. Um, yeah, I think I have to give you a German poo. That was a lot, but thank you so much. What an interesting lecture. I really think today you took us on a wild gender ride, so to say. And I'm going to try my best to summarize your lecture, to give us some context before we start having a discussion and going a bit more into detail. So what happened today? First of all, you started out with a global, actually a global history of feminism. And you even started before the first wave in 1848. So we went all the way back and somehow managed to end up in present times. Then, for the first time, we moved on to Judith Butler and her idea of gender performativity. 
You also spoke, and this is something I would like to ask a couple of questions on later on. You also spoke about the influence of social media. You quoted movements such as the slut war. I mean, the hashtag Me Too comes to mind, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, as you said yourself, you switched your focus from feminism to gender studies. And the first step here is a distinction, obviously, between sex and gender. And you quoted Rubin and Rubin's sex gender system, and we spoke about the kinship system. You gave historical examples of how women have been used as products throughout history. Next, you introduced Rubin's differences between sex and gender. And here again, Butler comes into play. Because for Butler, same thing is, the distinction between sex and gender is her starting point for her theory. However, she goes a step further because for her, even sex is a construct. Now, gender studies manages to bypass thereby the question of woman. And it also creates new woman, new images of the woman as being constructed and gender as being performed. And this is a very relevant turn, not just in history, but also in this presentation. Because now, as you said, gender is provisional, shifting, contingent, and performed. And as you said, um, and here we're coming back to Shruti's question from the beginning, which I'm sure we will discuss afterwards. A woman now has every right to perform whoever she wants to be and independent of the male gaze. After this, we looked at famous examples for performativity in the movies from international movie examples and actors. And then we are entering, finally, queer studies. And we start with queer activism. You gave the example of the Litfest Homogon in Cologne, my hometown, so I was really proud. And I just have to add that we also have a gay Christmas market, which is amazing. So please come visit. Now, going back, um, as you said, queer studies has emerged from lesbian and gay studies, but with a difference. Because even terms of sexual orientation, such as lesbian and homosexual, as you said, can be limiting. So again, we're breaking out of binary systems or systems of any way. And the term queer thus gives us the freedom needed as an umbrella term. We move on to cis men, cis women, um, and we see shifts finally happening in heterosexuality as well. In contrast, as you said, no one is outed in queer studies. I'm just name dropping here. The next thing you spoke about, because otherwise it will take too long, was compulsory heterosexuality by Adrian Rich. And two questions which I find relevant for the discussion, discussion afterwards. First of all, what does literature do for gender and queer theories? And also, what do gender and queer theories do for literature? And lastly, and this was your outlook, where are the places where we will see changes happening in the future? So I really hope this sums up the massive amount of details you gave us about feminism, feminist history, uh, queer studies, gender studies, et cetera, et cetera. And before I open up the discussion, I would actually like to ask one question first, which is, now, coming from a gender or queer perspective, does it even make sense to talk about women's literature? Is this still relevant? Uh, I think so, yes. It still remains relevant to talk about women's literature because, uh, as I continuously maintained or argued, queer is not limiting the woman's perspective. Neither is gender studies. It is neither bypassing it, nor it is limiting it. It is, it is giving the woman the space she requires with including others also. So I would say, no, it is, yes, women's studies, women's questions still remains relevant in gender theory. I actually agree. And I think you just answered my next question, which was how has gender studies helped women? And maybe that's the point where we can ask Shruti just for a quick comment. This answer your question. Just a reminder, the question is, so can the woman's question be answered through the lens of gender studies? Shruti, how do you feel? 
yeah, I, I think I'm pretty satisfied. <laughs> I'm very happy. <laughs> and uh, there, there are, um, I mean, the first point that I take from your, um, uh, from your analysis of Judith Butler is um, how the gender, the concept of gender has been able to free the free women's understanding and interpretation of the selves uh, from the male gaze, the masculine gaze. I think that is the first thing that she does. So that's the first corrective measure that Judith Butler actually uh, proposes and uh, very successfully also implements, right? And then obviously we have people like Luz Irigare, we have uh, Alison Stone, we have uh, people like um, uh, Helene Sisu, right? For example, the laugh of Medusa. So we have very strong voices that actually take up the woman's cause again. Um, Iris Marion Young, for example. Yeah, so these are names who are, have, who start building upon uh, this idea of gender. And I think this is a very, very important milestone in our understanding. And it is a very important trajectory in the history of women's um, thinking of themselves and interpretation. Thank you so much. Right. Maybe now is the time to ask the audience, are there any other questions right now, things you would like to comment on, you would like to ask, you can ask in person or in the chat. Am I missing this? There is a chat, yes. Um, okay, let's start with the first question, which is, does the performative identity of being neutral, neutral as social or a personal phenomenon? Uh, it also becomes a social phenomenon because uh, no man is an island or no woman is an island and we are social beings after all. So, of course, it is performing identity is very much a social phenomenon as well as a personal phenomenon. Thank you. Moving on to the next question by um, Disha also. Does the word feminine include the nature traits of a female or is there no assignment of traits to each of the genders? Uh, originally, yes, feminine, which comes from the word femina, did have the traits assigned to the female. Okay. And the last question from the chat is, what role can the characteristic of empathetic behavior play in the formulation of gender studies theories? I didn't quite get the question because gender studies is it is empathic in the sense it is uh, including the various genders. I mean, what can be more empathetic than that? I agree. I really hope that answers Disha's messages. Otherwise, she can also just raise her hand and participate in the conversation. Are there any other questions right now? There is a general resistance against pronouns, non-binary gender, with the reason of it being too confusing or complicated. What can help to simplify it? Sensitization, practice. I mean, everything in the beginning is complicated. It's just a matter of practice, I guess, which would. I think I would also like to comment here, especially yeah. coming from a perspective of the linguist that I am. In my opinion, there is nothing more confusing than the generic masculine form, which in most texts leaves you asking, like, are we talking about men or women or whatever here, right? And uh, maybe some of my students are in the room because I do usually include one session on gender correct language in German in my seminars. And I feel like after giving it a try, so I use the gender asterisk, which, which is one version of inclusivity in the German language. And I feel like after getting the hang of it, it's actually quite easy. And the more you practice, the better at it you get. Um, maybe we just move on to harsh right now because there is, I see a, a raised hand. Harsh, would you like to ask your question? I think you're muted. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Bhut and uh, Ms. Saad for this uh, wonderful session. Uh, my, uh, there's just a minute observation uh, when we are talking about empathy and how you know, uh, gender studies can uh, create empathy. But when we are talking about like the, the uh, 
example that you set up like uh, Kamal Hassan, uh, Amir Khan and Brad Pitt. Somewhere these uh, examples do uh, uh, get into the category of uh, the straight man. And of course, uh, seen the Amir Khan uh, movies that are usually the earlier movies that he did. And it's the later works that are more, I think, uh, progressive and things, but, uh, uh, and Brad Pitt, I do not know if we can say about it. So when we are taking examples, uh, I, I think it would have been a better, uh, uh, it, it would have been better if we could take like uh, Timothy Chalamet, who, which is, uh, who, who has played role, but he also, I think, identify as uh, a cis male. Uh, on the other hand side, we are seeing, uh, uh, I think there are uh, many actors who are coming out as uh, uh, from the closet, uh, as you stated. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, I think that's just a minor observation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'll note it. And uh, absolutely, it does make sense, of course. Yes. Maybe just a comment to this, um, because that's one thing I was also thinking about when I saw these pictures, is this really famous fashion cover, which was shot in the last, I think, two, three years with Harry Styles, where he's also wearing dresses. And it's it's a beautiful shoot. But even then, I asked myself the same question, which I saw pop up a lot on social media. It's like, great, so why do we see these like white cis males wearing dresses in magazines now? What about actual dress gender people? And this still seems to be a topic, right? Yeah, yeah. Perfect, I think there is another um, question by Arati. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tina Rat for uh, this, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, letting me uh, ask the question and thank you mayor it was a wonderful presentation i just wanted to uh because you were talking about this uh, uh transgen uh, like uh clothing um according to different gender you know like you gave the example of kamal hassan and amir khan and on so right. i uh i just got reminded of uh something which happened recently only there was one guy from Kolkata, he went to Spain and he was dressed up in sari. So, uh, and it was not somebody, he was not a celebrity, but he was just making a statement that uh, you can wear whatever clothes you want. So I just wanted to know if you had, uh, are you aware of that? Did you hear about that? That is one thing. Yeah. No, I was not aware of this uh, uh, particular uh, example which you have taken. But of course, we do have uh, our very famous Rituparno Ghosh, who has who came out of the closet in his latter years. Unfortunately, he is no more. But I mean, the transformation was beautiful. I can say, if you look at the pictures of Rituparno Ghosh as a male, and then when he did come out of the closet and when he did come out in these beautiful saris, it was brilliant. So I, I've just shared the picture image in the chat box. You can see it here. The man is like he's he's having a beard and he is like he hasn't shaved himself. He is not trying to be a woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wraps a sari around. Yeah, so yeah. Something it made uh, it made news the time he did it in and walked that way in um, in the streets of Madrid. Right. Right. That's one thing, and second thing, like uh, um, uh, my daughter, she goes in a um, middle school, but uh, in the high school, like if she goes to uh, maybe in, when she is in class ninth and ten, they have a custom, like they have something like twice they dress up during uh, in their time in the high school, like once they can just dress up the way they want, they can dress up. Uh, in a very festive manner. And second is like they have to dress up in trance, like you dress up according to the other gender. So I think these, these are the steps that you can normalize yes. the uh, uh, gender thing in the society, the concept of gender. And right. the third thing I wanted to, this is a question. Like you said that sex is something which is um, uh, uh, now, quoting uh, theorists, you said that sex is something which is natural, like how uh, it comes to us, and gender is constructed. And with the evolution of like uh, the the uh, what, what can I say, 
like with the uh, with the way the, uh, the women issues has evolved further in gender issues, gender studies like women studies it has come to gender study and then you said queer, queer studies so what i understand that nobody is trying to uh, demolish the construct of gender rather now the focus is on making it performative fluid absolutely so is it a way to uh, demolish the gender or what it is how do you see it uh no it is not in fact you answered the question yourself it it is not about demolishing genders it is not about demolishing the notions of heterosexuality which have existed it is broadening the spectrum i would say so i think there was a question about heterosexual which i didn't uh, i mean i've lost the question now but it is questioning reconceptualizing what do we mean by heterosexuals you know when when we talk about is heterosexual just a man having affinity towards women heterosexual if that man has or admires or even somebody like this person who cross dresses does that person automatically become non heterosexual this is this is what we are doing this is what gender is allowing us to do you don't have to remain that heterosexual you can perform and with every performance you can determine your identity you can determine yourself you can construct a new self so it is not demolishing it is not delimiting it is in fact opening the spectrum and it is whether i choose to be called trans woman or trans female it is about giving one options and that is very important for us as human beings today in the 20th in the 21st century that these options exist for us that we choose to be what we want to be and this needs to be validated in our societal uh uh rents so it's more about enhancing and broadening the horizon than demolishing or delimiting i would say thank you i think ari that answers your question and we are moving on to aishwarya yeah yeah sure thank you Ashwarya, are you next? If you still want to ask a question, you had raised your hand. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Tina. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Booth, for your wide-ranging lecture. Um, you know, my question sort of echoes the comment Shruti has just put in there. Um, I was thinking about uh, choice uh, because that word came up several times in your uh, lecture. Um, i i i just was uh, curious about a more uh, you know a deeper account of choice what exactly does choice mean uh, in this particular context because you know i have not um, in terms of gender i've not chosen to be a woman i've become a woman and so um, you know even if one goes by butler's account i do i haven't read all her books but you know what i remember from my graduate training uh you know the idea of uh, gender being constructed in society is actually in a sense a very deterministic framework you know that your um, your gender identity is uh, you know is subject to forces and pressures in of the social course. world and it is within that you know existing sort of uh, framework of pressures that one finds one one's agency so that agency is also really bound within the horizon of forces pressures uh, in that sense and i was also thinking of if i, I think it was kierkegaard who said this um the danish existential existentialist philosopher that you know the very moment that you are actually exercising your freedom that moment of freedom actually is um in a sense the greatest uh, you know the, the experience of fatedness 
Mm. Uh, of course, that that's coming from you know existentialism, which yeah. is a totally different. Uh, but uh, you know, I um, I'm not sure. You know, when you know, I, I'm not sure we choose our gender identity in the way uh, that we say, for instance, choose Coca Cola instead of Pepsi. Uh, you know, in the supermarket. Um, so there's a certain liberal account of freedom, like say, I, I choose to vote for Ahmadmi Party instead of Bharatiya Janata yeah. Party. Yeah. Um, but you know, in in the case of one's gender identity, I you know I, I'm not sure it's um, it's really choice in that sense. I mean, I, choice. Um, so for instance, I have you know I, I I've had access to certain privileges which have allowed me to, uh, you know, access empowerment, which then allow me to access certain goods as a woman, right? Um, and so choice is also, so, I mean, I don't know if that's choice really, because the choice is, you know, contingent on so many other social processes. Um, so, yeah, that, that was just a, yeah. Uh, I completely agree with you, Aishwarya. Uh, the question is what even Shruti is asking isn't reimagining, reinventing one's gender. Easier said than done. So I completely agree with both of you. I mean, what is choice? I mean, how do I plan to choose to be this or that? Uh, see, because, uh, but the thing is, as what Butler says, it's about performing. We are performing all the time. So if, if I am socially gendered to be a woman, that's what I have been thought one can say with the socialization process can i still now be a uh, very uh, uh, deliberately very very uh, intentionally different if i had been taught to sit in a particular manner as a woman for example crossing legs can i now consciously choose to sit differently that choice I have. And then talking about, this is a question which even I was asking myself when I was reading and when I was uh, preparing. Uh, are we, are most of us, even aware of what gender do we actually belong to till we perform that? So it, it's only in the moment of performance or it's only in the moment of enacting that we become conscious of what we are doing and let me tell you that until and unless we ask ourselves this question most of us are not even conscious of what we are doing right so until it's pointed out to us yeah shruti i think shruti has something to say just may i please just a quick um yeah so here, you know, uh, I mean, is it that easy? And my, I, I still st stand by that. Um, it's easier said than done, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, my body, the first time I got to know that I've, I'm a woman is perhaps there are many steps, of course, at puberty. Uh, but even before that, perhaps uh, maybe after that, when I was said, I was told by my mother not to leave or stay out for a long time. Uh, whereas my brother was, it was okay when my brother was uh, out there in the night with his friends and he came back all safe, etc. Safety was an issue. Yeah, these are things. And secondly, you know, I was thinking about school system when we, we, we were talking about uh, how, what the step, what, what is the step forward. I remember uh, class, uh, my, my kids, both of them went to school and the first things that they learned after having learned how to say their names was, I am a boy. Uh, this was hammered into them, you know, I am a boy, I go, I study in class, whatever KG, and I am a boy, and my niece was learning, I'm a girl. So why are we doing this to ourselves? If gender uh, is such yeah, but, a fluid notion, why don't we understand even today? But that's exactly the problem with the praxis and theory, because see, what has been um, uh, inculcated in us has remained, I mean, look, Today, we are talking about, on one hand, gender and queer theory and studies, but look at the situation of women in not only rural India, but even in metropolis India. So what are we talking about? Theories are, at sometimes I think, very, very elitist. Mm. You know, when you look at the situation, when you look at the actual, look at what's happening today in Ukraine, and if you are talking, if you 
I mean, none of this would even make sense. So, of course, in, I mean, there are many paradoxes which are happening, but a lot of it comes even from sensitizing ourselves. And I don't think our generation has been sensitized to these differences. We are still hammering in, I'm a boy and I'm a girl, and we are still thinking about pink and blue. Yes. So, I mean, I mean, if it takes 1920 for an airline to say, okay, no longer ladies and gentlemen, but lay, dear guests, I mean, imagine how long it's going to take us who are already um, encultured in with a certain way of thinking to, as uh, somebody said, uh, isn't it confusing all these pronouns? How long is it going to take us to you know, put that into practice. We may be sensitive, but even today, like see, even today by mistake, I would say mankind. It takes a lot of practice. So it doesn't come that easy. It takes a lot of thought processes. Maybe it would take generations, but it is a way forward. It is, I think, uh, you know, inculcating, making it a part of your practice, of your habits which can bring about a change. So I do appreciate schools where I think Aarti mentioned that uh, her children, but why then just, we, we kind of it make it tokenism when we have this one day, this one friendship day and one mother's day and one father's day, all this is then, you know, kind of tokenism. So why not let children dress up the way they want to? Why do parents have to hammer into children what clothes they should wear and what they shouldn't. I mean, I, 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 uh, there was this Angelina Jolie's daughter who has dressed up as a boy and now she's coming out and she has these very feminine clothes, which is, I think, perfectly fine. But for that, you need that kind of enlightenment. So although we talk about education in our country, I'm talking now about India and the Indian context, we, I don't think we are really talking about education. We talk about a lot of qualified individuals, but I don't really think we are, all those qualified individuals are educated enough to be sensitive enough and to, you know, bring out, to accept, to respect and tolerate these sensibilities. So it's, it's going to take a very long time for, you know, these kind of theoretical concepts to be put into practice, at least in a country like ours. Maybe just a quick comment, because I completely agree with everything all of you said before. And I also made the experience myself that actually changing your performance, your gender performance is, I wouldn't even say it's not easy. It's actually painful. And the worst thing is how many yeah. other people react towards you, yeah. especially other women. So it yeah. is a very difficult, complex process, which will take right. a long time. That's just one thing I would like to add to the discussion right now, because we had mentioned it before. And that's also for me, at least a positive outlook. So the question is, what is the role of social media? What options, opportunities do we have in social media? What, what do you think about this? So I think anybody can answer this question, but I would say social media has actually opened this, I mean, this uh, debate and we now have a wider platform, you know, to come together, to think together, to deliberate together. So I think the role of social media is very, very important. And uh, I think it's going to do a lot of sensitization even without uh, people realizing it, you know, especially for the teenagers it is going to play a very major role. And uh, it's a good thing that something like a movement like Me Too, I mean, imagine without the social media, the Me Too would not have been possible, at least not in India, the way it started out in India. So it does play a very, very defining role, I would say. And I think it will continue to play. And not only social media, but even performing arts, they do have a lot of potential. And the very fact that now we have virtual rooms, this kind of virtual spaces to discuss this kind of, to even discuss the social media, it kind of manifolds the potential it has. 
I can see Anania has a question and then I promise I will start using questions from the um, chat. I forgot about this, I'm sorry, but yeah. I can see many of you has questions. We will come to this in a second. But first of all, Anania, please. Uh, so we devoted some time in like talking about the different waves of feminism in the beginning, right? So I was just, so we're taking up the task of discuss, discussing like women's literature in the lecture series. So I just wanted to ask, like, given that they were written in a different time during a different wave of feminism, what would you say we need to like keep in mind from like a fourth wave perspective when we like deal with like such anecdotal evidence from like the past? Oh, that's a brilliant question. But I mean, we are looking at context. So sometimes we need to, you know, I would say remain within that context to look at the social movements. Uh, your question is looking at the social movements happening now, and you want to kind of compare it with what is happening in the first wave, if I understand correctly, right? So uh, what are the, I mean, what is the playing field for the first wave? Besides these posters and placards and besides newspaper articles and newspaper which is being read not by all, where is the outreach? It's not as great as the fourth wave, right? So uh, uh, that was even uh, Tina Rath's question. The social media can just, I mean, kind of, you can explore and you can um, um, uh, reach to a wider audience than what was happening in the first wave. So the first wave, of course, uh, I mean, there were, uh, these movements did manage to reach other countries, but it's still happening in clo in very, very limited pockets. So I would say the impact of the first wave remains in the uh, places where they are happening and then spreading, whereas in the fourth wave, thanks to these social medias, they're happening simultaneously in different parts of the world. I don't know. I hope I've answered your question because I didn't quite correctly understand it. Oh, no, no, you did. Like that is okay. an important thing to keep in mind, I think, like the yeah, limited yeah. nature of, yeah. because like many of the subjects that we, like we've been reading, even in the course, they're not like exactly like feminists, but yeah. I think that like limited exposure to the politics of the time is like also important. Mm -hmm. Also, it feels like we're going back and forth a lot, right? I mean, I, I remember seeing your picture on the slide because I took a note and it was about women in the second wave of feminism protesting for their rights to abortion. And just think about what happened last year in the US, right? So many of these topics are still so relevant all over the world. And now chat, question from Anushka, how do you distinguish equity and equality and feminism? Okay, so equality is about being equal. Equity is about there's something like, I mean, very banal example, like uh, in uh, a, a, for a particular uh, job profile, the man will earn more than the woman. So on one hand, you say women are equal to men and therefore they get to be in that position. But when it comes to paychecks, the man is earning more than the woman. So equity is talking about like getting equal pay it's not just about equal rights but also you know getting the equal opportunities and the other parameters being equal that is equity thank you we have another quite interesting question and i can see sad you actually because you have your camera on so i will read out your question and maybe you could comment on it so he's asking can traditional genders be seen as statistical tendencies with value validity derived from numbers rather than from essence and therefore not simply dependent on personal identity? Quite a complex question. Would you like to comment on your question before you get your answer, Sergio? No reaction, yeah. It looks like I managed to unmute. I'm still getting used to all those um, little thingies that I can choose and so on in here. Um, I guess I'm still a bit foreign to all those new communication methods. But um, uh, 
If I can make a, a comment on this question, to me, it was um, something more or less like this. Um, I'm not um, a student of gender studies. I, I don't have much experience in this area. So I speak more as someone who has seen the debate from a distance and uh, in um, and uh, uh, without such deep understanding of it. But it seemed to me at some point that um, when new genders or new approaches to gender are given um, more attention, um, it is in a sense um, attention that is being given to people who were not being recognized or whose um, perception of themselves was not being accepted or acknowledged as such. And for every person in this situation, this is, of course, um, a bad thing that needs to be corrected. But at the same time, this was supposed to be a question of problematizing the very concepts of gender. That is, what does it mean to be a man or a woman? Is it a question of performance? Does it have any connection with the kinds of bodies that we have? And so on and so forth. Does it have anything to do with statistically preponderant personality types? and uh, uh, with the way the personality features tend to cluster according to some uh, psychological studies. And so it occurred to me, it's as if we are trying to claim that everything has more or less the same status as everything else, which in a more philosophical sense is, I think, true. But statistics tends to suggest that there are more frequent cases my formation is that of a linguist. So I always thought of genders and words for genders like male, female, man, woman, in the same way that I thought about the meanings of all words, that they are prototypical categories, which have prototypes, which are basically defined by our experience with the objects or the entities that we tend to classify under that word. So the things that we encounter more frequently tend to color um, the meaning of that category. We tend to call dogs and think about dogs in terms of the dogs that we see more often. We tend to think of birds and talk about birds in terms of the birds that we see more often. We see them more we see, we see them as more prototypical and so on. And one of the claims made is that statistics is involved. Um, prototypical birds are prototypical because they'd say, frankly, they are so frequent. We can't. Um, not be affected by them, given their numbers. So I wondered, isn't the same thing true for gender? And if so, then does gender also not include an element that is not really a choice in a meaningful sense, but actually emerges from our experience with realities that we encounter because the world is not simply a projection of our mind onto uh, some kind of amorphous reality or something like this. In other words, since we have to take the world as we experience it and frequent things impress more than unfrequent ones, doesn't that also give gender a non-choice aspect that needs to be um, taken into account? Yeah or something like that. yeah yeah that's thank you that's uh, that's a good observation i agree with your observation partly but then i would also like to question you i mean uh, as a linguist when you're talking about male and thinking about you know, uh, you know conceiving the significant 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 thing what you mean by male uh, you are ascribing qualities you are ascribing traits uh, in the linguistic sense, it may make meaning, it may make things understandable, meaningful. But what happens in a social and cultural context when these traits get abused? So that would be my question to you, Radha. Uh, how would you see that then that it's, you know, uh, talking about statistics, 
I don't know, how would you characterize, I mean, do we, can we characterize ourselves as heterosexual? Still we have, I don't think most, I would say, I mean, I don't have statistics here. I don't even have a valid evidence, but I'm talking from general experience. I mean, how many of us would be so sure of what we have as a gender? Are we sure? Can we then, and if we are not sure, can we put ourselves into these categories and say, I am this and I'm that? And when I say I'm this and that, can that be uh, uh, accountable in the statistics? So, I mean, do the statistics give you, what I'm trying to say is, can the statistics give you the correct picture? when one is unsure of what, I mean, would a census, would the census say of a state like India, where you have so many males and so many females, actually be a factual evidence of how many males and females are there in the country? In fact, uh, India is one of the few countries which allows the uh, option for the third gender or other just puts the other. And then when you say male, female, and other, if I were to do a statistical study of it, what is this other? And are the males who have called themselves males actually males and are the females actually, or they just thought they are because they have not explored their sexuality. So I think these are very, very complex issues and I mean, it needs a lot of, uh, it's a very thought provoking question which you have raised, <laughs> but I don't think I have an answer to it. I mean, I can only just- I would also like to comment if that's okay, because yeah, I yeah, sure, sure. such an interesting question and I completely understand where you're coming from. So I get, and I think it's quite a smart move to start with the prototypical approach to language, right? But what you're doing right now is you're staying in one language and I'm just going to use your metaphor to help you think about the topic. So let's take the tree, right? If I ask my students in India and I do this in my linguistics classes, paint a tree. The tree, the prototypical representation of what they think is a tree in India will look different, different from what Absolutely. my students will draw in Germany. Now think about it. What does this tell us about trees? What does this tell us about gender? And then think about gender being a construct, right? So right now we're categorizing humans in male and female. But imagine a world where we do not have categories as male and female. But, for example, we differentiate people in tall and short. And then again, we can use your prototypical approach to tall and short, and we will have prototypes. But what does it tell us about size? Again, what does it tell us about gender? And I think young Helga wants to comment on this as well. Yeah? Okay. No, I, okay. Please come in. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I agree with uh, what Tina and Meha just outlined, but I would like to add uh, two things. Uh, namely, the first thing, I think Meha hinted at that, culture is created. Uh, if I say, if I only see women wearing corset, corsets, and then I say, uh, statistically, uh, a woman is a person who wears a corset, that doesn't mean that it's a natural occurrence. I mean, the, the bird analogy I get, uh, what Tina said, I fully agree with. If I'm in India, I see more peacocks and kingfishers than I would see in Germany. But it's even more problematic because nobody created these kingfishers. Nobody put the peacock uh, somewhere in Delhi on the rooftop. Whereas with what then statistically counts for women and men would have been created by humans. And the second thing I would argue against it, though, like Tina, I see where you are coming from in a very positive way, but I would argue that it is not just that these people in a way were neglected, whether you uh, look at it from the female or the queer or whichever particular transgender perspective, but it is like they are punished for existing. I mean, right now in the United States with what you have uh, as called like the culture wars, you have the don't say gay. Uh, laws enacted in a couple of states. You have uh, teachers that are uh, not allowed to put a picture on the desk of their spouse. Uh, girls that start having their periods before eighth grade are not allowed to ask their biology teacher about periods that they're having in certain states. So it's just like 
Don't talk about being a woman. You're not allowed to say that you might have a period. Uh, do not talk about that you have a sexual orientation unless you have a heterosexual orientation. So it's it's much more it's much worse than what your statistical approach would yeah. actually imply. Like I, I get where it's coming from, and then of course we can actually with a size argument, Tina. I would disagree with you with size because when you think of like where should the airline put the uh, you know headroom lockers, of course you take a statistical average of of how tall humans generally are. Uh, but as soon as it comes to uh, gender, or I mean, as Judith Butler goes as far as sex, yes, in the end, this is created. It is not natural, although statistically, of course, you are right that there are uh, that amount of that percentage of people who uh, are born with, uh, uh, yes, I mean, female genitalia, male genitalia. So on that level, I think we fully agree. Uh, but in the end, that doesn't really tell us much. Uh, just yesterday, I saw in the German news uh, 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 an intersex uh, person who looks very, who looked very much like a man in the TV interview, uh, but he was recounting the horror of being born with uh, both sets of genitalia, which he until this day still has and suffers from numerous, uh, uh, you know, botched uh, operations because the doctors tried to fix it, but uh, in the end didn't and only made his life very miserable. And he's uh, he's under 30, he was under 30, the man yesterday, uh, the intersex person who, who clearly uh, uh, like reads, is read as a, as a male uh, uh, said. And I think so uh, the issue cannot really be solved with statistics because in the end, nature is fluid. I mean, you know, that's just it. Thank you so much, Jan Helge. Um, I would actually like to use two more questions from the chat that make reference to the Indian context. And I think they're both interesting. So we're starting with this one. How will terms like chest feeding or uterus carriers work in a country like India, where the birth of a girl child in a way is social resistance shown by the parents? And then this woman goes on to resist being killed, raped, etc., because of her gender, woman. Then the terms like women or breasts or uterus have been used for political resistance too by women in India. So what do we make of this? And I think it is an interesting question. Yeah, it's an interesting question from Sashri. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I think Sayashri has the answer for it too. I would like to hear Sayashri's comment uh, on it. Uh, Sayashri can, uh, yeah, Sayashri, she can do it. Uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, in uh, NHS literature and uh, probably in other uh, European right. countries, Scotland, uh, the language is changing, right? So it's no yeah. longer uh, vaginal birth, it's frontal birth or it's chest feeding, it's uterus carriers. Whereas I, as a woman, waking up without being murdered by a husband because as recent as four days ago we have this statistic from khm i believe which says the 21 percentage of uh, women who have been murdered uh, are are you know is is through male violence then just asserting my gender affirming my re it me being a woman is a political resistance and for me i'm finding it very very difficult to uh, deal with terms like uh, chest feeding because it is breastfeeding, right? It, for a woman, yes, I mean, I can understand the inclusive language, but I can only resist patriarchy. I can only resist man being a woman. And I don't, maybe 100 years from now, 200 years from now, I can accept the term for myself. But at least now, as an Indian woman, I'm, I'm, I'm finding it very hard to wrap my head around this. Yeah, I can imagine that, but I don't think this needs an answer because even I don't have an answer for this, but you have kind of, you know, answered your own question. So then I think it's time to move on to the last question for today's session coming from Professor Patra, who says, after thanking you for your great presentation, the Indian thought, tradition, and practice that could be relevant to allowing freedom to women? Oh, I think, of course, there have been uh, 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 examples in the Indian tradition, which are, I think the Indian, uh, uh, let me start by saying that the Indian society was a very progressive one, if you look at the Vedic times. 
and it is only through the centuries it is only through the colonial rule uh, that uh, that uh, society has regressed uh, looking at our modern times i would say at least for somebody who has been born and brought up in a city like mumbai it was a very very progressive city a very secular city in the 70s 80s when we were growing up it is again the political intervention which has made it very regressive so of course the indian tradition has been uh, quite progressive and there are instances where uh, it has in its own capacity allowed women to choose otherwise we would not have had and of course but then again uh, these have been women with privileges if we look at the historical tradition of our country we have women in the freedom struggle we have women in the earlier times fighting against the colonial you have the uh, rani om jhansi and you have uh, philosophers in the 8th and the 9th century women ph philosophers who are very very famous so there was a kind of a progressive outlook which has by and by diminished and in fact i think in 2020s we are more in a regressive society where women are concerned with all these uh, uh i think here it's the indian television which is like regressing the image of women more and more yes sir uh so yeah i mean apart from texts like manusmriti and all there have been i would say have allowed freedom to women in fact if you if i mean i usually tell this to my students also i mean um, of course then again there are uh, uh these biases that these women come from privileged families i mean if you look at politics women had a better place in the subcontinental politics than in the european politics so way back in the 70s you have in bangladesh you have in sri lanka you have in india you have in pakistan you have women rising to being the heads of states now where does that happen in europe it happens okay with golda meyer and um, uh, our margaret thatcher but in a developed country like germany itself it takes angela merkel what 2000 and uh, she came in the elections of 2008 i think yeah or yeah. i could be mistaken but it took 21st century whereas thanks to our education thanks to our broader outlook which we enjoyed i mean you have examples of madam kama shouting i mean uh, uh, hailing the flag of india in stuttgart in germany way back when women in the other part of the world were trying to fight for their right to vote mm -hmm. so i wouldn't i wouldn't say there's nothing positive i think there is a lot of positive things in the indian thoughts which have given the women freedom but again of course it is far and few between i mean if you look at on a broader spectrum if you look at the trajectory of the indian women where the masses are concerned yes there's still a lot to be done for them yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you thank you thank you so much for your thoughts uh, professor booth uh, i think this has been a very enlightening discussion uh, i would like to thank professor booth and ms christina rath for their time for answering our questions and for the great presentation it was a pleasure to have you with us and this was an extremely engaging first installment for the series of lectures that will be taking place in the following months regarding german women's writing so the second lecture is actually due to be held on the 27th of march Where we will be discussing women in conflict situations, witnessing and writing violence of 1945 in a diary, and we will be discussing that through a woman in Berlin. So we hope to see you all there for that as well. Uh, I've added uh, the PDF invitation for that to the chat box, so you can refer to that. And thank you everyone for attending. We hope it was a great learning experience, and we we hope like you all enjoyed this presentation as much as we did. So thank you so much for attending.
Thank you thank so you much. Everybody. Thank you so much, Ananya, for being such a lovely host. And thank you so much, Meher. Thank you, uh, Tina, Professor Batra, Sergio. Uh, by the way, Sergio is uh, the coordinator of the Center for Foreign Languages. He joined us a little later. And uh, yes, so he will be joining us. Uh, yeah. For in the next series, uh, like lectures as well, yeah, and where we will be introducing him properly, formally. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, and thank you to all thank the everybody. participants for patiently wonderful. being there. It was thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Very so comprehensive much. and very en enriching experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.